Within the first five minutes of meeting my new neighbor, he told me that I needed to protect my animals from chupacabras. Yeah, you heard that right. He must have interpreted my expression as a prompt to go into vivid detail. He began explaining that the local chupacabra population enjoyed attaching itself to one family at a time, and they were nearly impossible to outsmart. Not entirely impossible, but mostly. And yet, they are somehow dumb enough to think that as long as you didn't see them with your own eyes, that you really wouldn't think it was them doing what they do. But, once you see them with your own two eyes, and especially after you make eye contact with them, then they're likely to leave you alone. But up until then, you'll have your hands full. Without my prompting or my permission, he again launched into a story of an experience that he had had when he had first moved to an area, and one of the other neighbors had politely warned him about the presence of these unknown creatures, and he took them every which way, but seriously. I guess you couldn't blame him. He was a hobby rancher, just enough head of cattle to keep him busy, with plenty of milk, and the occasional animal to put it to market, if he needed the money badly enough. His cows thrived so well that he expanded his hobby to ranching to include now some chickens. That's when he started to have some trouble with the local wildlife. After all, chickens are a little easier to take down than a cow. He would often catch coyotes in similar trying to make a meal out of his chickens. But his ability with fences and wiring was good enough that the predators never actually got to do any good damage. They would just get caught planning to do it, and getting caught wasn't enough to dissuade them from making yet another attempt. Apparently, when you are hungry, you're hungry, and you'll take whatever risk you have to do. It wasn't long before the fact that his animals seemed untouchable that started to get to his head, and he began to think that if a rancher ever had animals that got hurt, it was more of the fault of the rancher than it was of the predator. After all, it's not like coyotes and wolves and other things have opposable thumbs, so the advantage and the responsibility and the accountability rests ultimately with the rancher. Then it happened. He came outside to make his rounds with the animals and their three chickens dead. They were inside their coop. There was no apparent evidence of any break-in or attempt to break-in. Utterly in dismay, he looked his dear birds over and saw puncture marks. Two large gouges in each of the necks of the birds. He said that his heart sank as he squeezed the corpses to see if there was any blood in them. There wasn't a drop, just all meat. Their eyes were even sunken in a little bit for more of a lack of fluid. His first initial reaction was one that his neighbors had tried to play a prank on him in the worst way possible, trying to get him to buy into the stores that were part and parcel with the community. But there was simply no explaining the way that the coop was untouched and ultimately unbreached. Something like that would not have been possible for any human. Really, this was a superhuman feat. Still, he wrote it off as some talent that his ordinary neighbors had that he just couldn't figure out at the moment. The carnage continued the very next night, and it wasn't long before he had no chickens left at all. Then, he began losing cattle, and that's when he was especially upset. He started setting his alarm at one or two hour intervals so that he could rush outside in the middle of the night to see whoever it was that was going to such great lengths to pull a prank on him. Once you found out who was doing it, he was going to beat the tar out of him and then sue them if they survived. He woke up for each alarm clock, like clockwork, and he would rush outside. But he never saw a culprit, which meant one of two things. Either they grew bored of the prank and moved on to other, bigger, better things, or they were on to him and they knew that he was looking for them. But with such an unhealthy sleep pattern, it was only a matter of time before he missed an alarm, and he did not make it outside. His eyes flew open on one such occasion, 
realizing he had missed several consecutive alarms, went outside in a rush, and finally caught them. But they were nothing like what he expected it to be. Instead of troublemaking teenagers, or maybe an antisocial old man, he was greeted by the sight of a creature that stood about as tall as your average juvenile capable of causing trouble. So somewhere in the range of four to five feet. At least that's how tall it would have been if it did not seem to be having a perpetual hunch in its shoulders from a lifetime of sneaking and skulking. It had just enough human features about it to make it wrong, especially in the eyebrows where there were all kinds of subtleties of intelligent emotion the rest of it was not only inhuman, but likely not even of this earthly realm. It had very lizard-like features, clammy scaly skin that was a pale pinkish blue, kind of like that of a decaying body. The eyes were large and black, clearly made for seeing in the dark and sleeping during light. Though sleep would be a difficult task for such a creature with long, sharp spines protruding from its back, the way the thing was put together, it was a wonder that it could ever get comfortable. Then, there were the teeth, as if the two long, sharp canines were made to fit inside the mouth four times bigger than the ones they were in. Somehow, the creature seemed surprised to see my neighbor, and a flurry of emotions flashed across its expressive face. It then ran off in a scamper, but not unlike a squirrel. It had been feeding on one of his cattle. Like the chickens, the cow was utterly devoid of all blood. For him, this was the last straw. He invested in traps and cameras, but it ended up being a total waste of money because the creature never returned. Not long after, there was rumor that another neighbor having trouble with the creature. And once it had finally seen it, then it moved on to a different household. The exact logic behind why it moved on when you saw it was ultimately unknown. I haven't seen anything yet myself, and nothing seems to harass my animals yet, but I'll be prepared if that ever changes. Growing up in a small and rural community, I found out firsthand that small town dwelling is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because people are not isolated from each other due to being surrounded by strangers all the time. If you don't see anybody for a long time, you notice it. Their absence is noticed and felt. It's a curse because you don't have a whole lot of privacy. You are in such close quarters to each other, and you can't really get away and take a vacation from each other if you need to. You're always going to see each other at the general store, because, well, it's the only store in town. Things like that. And if small town communities don't work together, they don't survive, plain and simple. So, I learned early on that any small town is a powder keg for a spark of drama. All it takes is the wrong words said by one family member to a member of another family, and then entire generations of people will hate each other, and they'll continue hating each other long after anybody remembers how the fight began. As far back as I could remember, my family was always in conflict with the other biggest family in town. If either one of us decided to pick up and move, it would be like most of the town had disappeared. At the time, either one of us would have been just fine and dandy as if the other family had decided to pick up and leave. But obviously egos and pride ran a little deeper than that. I wasn't even allowed to play with any of the kids from the other family, and vice versa. All the other smaller families here and there in town avoided both of us for fear of angering either side. They acted as if having anything to do with one or the other would result in them waking up to torches and pitchforks outside their windows. Things came to a head one morning when my father ran inside, raging like an angered bull. He was so worked up that it was several minutes before any of us could ultimately understand a thing he was saying. Then the details began to emerge slowly. One of the goats was dead, stone dead, and it absolutely 
had to have been the work of the other family. He was certain. They were probably plotting against that particular goat, and us by extension for months, because that's the kind of people they are. Even at 10 years of age, I knew my dad had to have been hungry for the slightest legitimate excuse to act against the other family. And in his mind, that's exactly what he had found with this goat. My curiosity got the better of me, and I slipped outside to go look at the crime scene. There was indeed a dead goat, and no blood. There wasn't any mangled meat or fur. And when I took a closer look upon inspection, I noticed there wasn't any blood because simply the animal did not have any. I already knew how to bleed an animal, and my inspection could not produce a slight droplet of fluid. I did find two holes punctured in the animal's neck, but there appeared to be no broken bones, no cracked ribs, no signs of a struggle or twisting or mutilation or anything, no signs of a predator or somebody approaching it and doing harm. The only thing that was truly wrong with this animal was the fact that it was missing all blood. About the time that my father went over to confront the other family, they were making preparations to confront him. They too had suffered the death of some of their animals, and they argued that the whole thing was my father's fault because several of their animals were dead, while only one of ours was dead. It was a miracle that things did not come to blows that day, but there would be many more opportunities because animals on both sides were turning up dead in the morning, completely drained of all blood. Things got more and more heated and tense with each passing death. I took it upon myself to stay up late one night, hoping just to catch a glimpse of whoever was responsible because at this point, it would not have surprised me if the person that began the whole thing was from either side. I would have been just as surprised if it had been somebody from their family as I would have if it were my father the whole time. I sat under the shadow of one of the trees so that in the moonlight, I was concealed in complete darkness. I was about to fall asleep when I looked up and saw the thing. It was not the size or shape of anybody from either family. Actually, it wasn't the size of the shape of anything that I had ever seen on this earth. Its entire natural posture was wicked. It looked sneaky and conniving and stealthy. The overall bearing that you see of a mosquito, designed for stealth and speed, with a slight hunch in its back. With the size and placement of its eyes and its tail and its claws, the spines on its back, you would have expected to see scales like a lizard covering all of its skin. But instead, it appeared to have flesh like you or I, with very small, isolated patches of hair. It sprang upon one of the goats like a frog and strangled it so that it could make no sound. When the animal appeared to lose consciousness, it bit into the goat's neck with teeth that looked to be longer than the thickness of the neck it was biting into. The creature left the goat in a heap when it was done feeding, I felt like I had discovered the key to defusing the Civil War. I approached my father and told him what I had seen. He listened to me without a single facial expression, so I wasn't sure if he was actually listening or if he thought I was star-craving bonkers. He actually seemed to consider what I was saying. He never came down on me, but my conversation with him was not without consequences. Next thing I knew, my father was spending time in jail because apparently he had gone over and started a physical fight with the head of the other family. He had twisted my account into a report of how I apparently had seen one of his sons come over onto our property and kill our animals. As if the breach between both families wasn't bad enough, that made it worse, and it's still gradually escalating to this day. From time to time, there's still a dead, drained animal found on somebody's property, and the blame flies like burning arrows each time. I don't know what that creature is or where it came from, but I want it gone.